And I applied to become an officer, professional officer in the army, which meant 25 years minimum service. So when you signed up, you signed up for 25 years. And that was it. And there was no get, once you're sworn in, then there was no getting out of it. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. <laughs> This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Fünf, zwei, sieben, eins, sechs, sechs, neun, acht, acht, drei. This is Radio Bucharest, Romania. Listeners following by great popular manifestations in the capital city of Romania, Bucharest, and all over the country. Today, December 22nd, 1989, the dictatorial regime of Nicolae Ceausescu was overthrown. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 39 of Cold War Conversations. Today we speak with Torsten Belger, who trained as an artillery officer in the East German Army. Torsten runs German.Militaria, which is a website selling various items of East German Militaria and civilian items too. It is well worth a visit. Adam Spink, you know who you are. Adam Spink is our latest Patreon, part of an increasing band of loyal supporters of the podcast who are getting exclusive extras, including previews of future episodes, as well as content that didn't make the final cut. Available for as little as a monthly donation of a euro, a dollar or a quid, although larger amounts and other currencies are accepted too. Just head over to coldwarconversations.com and click on the support the podcast menu option. Thank you very much to those listeners who are already supporting us. I'd also like to thank our latest reviewer in iTunes, Mac Jack B, for another five-star review. Please do add reviews to your podcast provider's sites. It really does help to spread the word. Now, back to today's episode. Torsten tells us in fascinating detail about his schooling and how he ended up on the officer training course. Spoiler alert, though, this episode does end on a cliffhanger. We welcome Torsten Belger. The first thing I wanted to ask you was, what can you tell me about your early home life? Okay, Um, well... Obviously, just to put it into context, I was born in 1968. So obviously, you know, mostly grew up throughout the, the, the 70s and 80s um, in East Germany. Um, lived in a tower block, basically. Um, small tower block, not one of those massive big ones that you'd see in, in so the So a, a Plattenbau. A Plattenbau, yeah, but 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 a small one. Um, so I grew up in, in, in effectively a Plattenbau. Um, parents had a flat there. Um, I have one brother, a younger brother. Um, born in 71. And my parents were just ordinary workers, basically. My mother, um, both office workers. So my mother worked in an office in, in, in a factory in my hometown in a, in a shoe factory. And my father worked in an office in a, in a foundry. So making radiators. Right. Basically. And, and where was this? What town was that? That's in Schönebeck. So Schönebeck is, is, is near Magdeburg. So right. south of Magdeburg on the River Elbe. Um, it's about maybe a hundred miles west of Berlin. But about roughly the same height as Berlin. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's very close to Magdeburg. Okay. And w- your family did did they um, what what were their views on the government and on the way East Germany was run? Were they supporters of the? Um, well, they weren't. They weren't. They weren't. Um, they weren't against the government. Mm-hmm. Let's say it that way. They were not members of the party. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, I don't think there was really anybody in my family that was was a member of the party or a member of the SED. Um, everyone and the vast majority of people in East Germany weren't members of the party. You yeah, know, you might want to remember that as well. I mean, I think there were maybe about two million members at the end in, in 1989. But there were 17, 16, 17 million people living in East Germany. So, so my parents were certainly they were not in the party. They were not they were not politically active in any way, pro or or con. 
the government as such. They they, they held no office. They yeah. were just ordinary people. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, what what was your schooling like? Schooling in East Germany was very good. I would say. And obviously, I've had some chance to compare that to schooling in this country now. Yeah, this is going to be an interesting comparison. <laughs> um, so, no, schooling was very good in East Germany. And I think I think um, graduates from East Germany, even now within the, the, the reunified Germany and shortly after reunification, had a, had a good um, reputation for being well-educated, for being being well-trained. Well, um, mm-hmm. um, so, school, I mean... Typical school in East Germany was was you did something called a POS, which was Poly- Polytechnische Oberschule, mm. which was the first 10 years of schooling, which pretty much everyone did, apart from those that weren't capable and they left after after year eight. Mm-hmm. Um, but the vast majority, you know, finished year 10, which was POS. Um, and after that, which I, I did also, um, and after that, basically, you had an option to either go into a professional trade, which is Facharbeiter in German or in East Germany, which would have been two years. So is that like an apprenticeship? Or something? Kind of like an apprenticeship, but you get you get a, a but it's school and apprenticeship, so you get a full qualification of it afterwards. It's called okay. Facharbeiterabschluss in, in German, um, which would have been two years, or you could do Facharbeiter mit Abitur, which which would be to basically do the an apprenticeship, but also do A levels at the same time, which would then allow you to, to go to university, or you could go to to another type of school, which was an, an AOS. A vital Oberschule, which is what I did, mm-hmm. which which basically you went straight on continued with schooling for another two years to do to do the Abitur, and the Abitur is basically the German A levels, and you needed the Abitur to go to university. Right. So right. that's what I did. So I did not do an apprenticeship. I stayed on and continued with schooling for another two years up up to year twelve. Okay. Okay. And, and what I, I'm always interested to know the sort of what what level of political indoctrination was included in East German schooling? A lot. <laughs> Can you elaborate a bit? Um, a lot. There would have been, you know, both on, on like an academic level, so there would have been subjects at school. Um, there was a subject called Staatsbürgerkunde, which is basically, I'm not sure now what the equivalent English one is, but it's like citizenship, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Could compare it to that. So there was, was a subject called Staatsbürgerkunde, which was very much about socialism, socialist economy, Communism, you know, Marx, Engels, Lenin, yeah, um, that sort of stuff, and that was that was a full, full, full on subject. Going, I think it started in year six or seven at school. There was not much before that, and that was a compulsory subject that you. Had oh to yeah, do. that's that's yeah. yeah, that's what I meant. It's a full on compulsory subject. Right. Yes, everyone had to do it. Yeah. Um, so we did that, I think, till year eleven. So I think that was that finished in year eleven. That wasn't year twelve. That wasn't continued then. Um, but that, so that's like, like the academic part of it. But obviously aside of that, aside from that, there was, was, was a lot of, um, you know, obviously there were the various organizations that, that you were sort of, you did not have to be a member, but you were expected to be a member. Yeah. Like, like the Thelman Pioneer initially. So Junge Pioneer, you know, yeah. with, the, with the blue scarf. And yeah, then yeah. afterwards you with the- went on to the red scarf. And then at, at age 14, you, you, you joined the, the FDJ, you know, Freie Deutsche Jugend. Yeah, with your blue shirt. And then you got a blue shirt to wear, which you had to pay for yourself, by the way. It wasn't, <laughs> you didn't get that for free. Um, but, and, and, and pretty much like 99.9% did that. Not everyone did. Yeah. You know, but, yeah. but the vast majority did. Yeah. Um, so, so, and that, there were a lot of, um, extracurricular activities. Mm. Um, as uh, you know, associated with the 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 Thema Pioneer, associated with yeah. the FDJ, so so most after not most afternoons, but but at least uh, pff, I don't know, maybe one two afternoons a week, mm-hmm. there would have been some meeting or some trip away, some something, yeah, going on in in relation to those organizations. Where obviously there was which which were political organizations, yeah, for children, yeah. So there would have been some. You, in hindsight now, obviously, I, I, I would call it, yes, indoctrination. But at the time, it didn't necessarily feel like that. It was just a normal thing to do. Yeah, no. Well, you wouldn't know any different, would you? No, you so. wouldn't know any different. It was a normal thing to do. Everybody did it. Yeah. It's just the way it was. Yeah. Can you can you remember what you were taught about the UK in, in any of the lessons? I mean, what, to what, totally how, was it, how was it described? Not much. Okay. Specifically about the UK now. Um, America more so, was it? Uh, well, Soviet Union a lot more. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah. obviously, you know, and as, as far as political schooling went and, 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 and history went, it was very much biased towards the Eastern Bloc. Mm-hmm. 
um, and, and, and and even more so, of course, towards towards um, socialism, communism, etc. So so post nineteen seventeen. Yeah. History obviously was very important and was, was covered in some detail. Yeah. Um, yeah. Western world, the, 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 you know, the USA, revolutionary wars, um, UK was also covered to some extent, but, but more selectively. So like when it came to the UK, for example, focus would have been more on these utopian socialists, mm -hmm. for example. You know, yeah. Um, and, and that there were good people. Yeah. In the UK. Not yeah. everyone was a bad capitalist. Yeah. So, so the focus would have been more on that. Yeah. Yeah. Rather, rather than a general history of the UK. So it wouldn't have been much about kings and queens of, of, of Britain. No, no, I example. can't imagine. It was interesting. I was looking at, uh, somebody had posted a picture of, uh, a German textbook for, of a series called English for You, which I think was on yeah, English German for You. TV. Is this, it wasn't just on TV. That was the school. Right. The English school language course. So, so this English for You were the school books we got. Right. And that's where you first learned your English, was it? Yes. There. So, so yes. So, so in year seven, you had a choice to do to do. Well, everybody had to do Russian as a foreign language. So, mm -hmm. if we want to talk about that. Everyone had to do Russian from year five at school, and then from year seven, you had the option to to take a second foreign language, which normally would have been a choice between French and English. Except at my school, there were no French teachers, so we only had English teachers. Yeah. Um, so it didn't really get much of a choice. Um, and had to take English then, and that was from year seven and. You did not have to do the second foreign language, but, but that was an option. Mm. But if you wanted to go on to university at some point, you needed to have two foreign languages. Oh, okay. At, at A level. Right. Everyone had to. It doesn't matter if you're studying master physics or, or history or whatever it might be. Yeah. So, so if you wanted to go on to do more in future life, then you, you needed to do the second language. Yeah. And I did that. And, and, and this English for you was the, and, and the thing on TV. I mean, we watched that in class. So yeah. th those those programs were for school. Yeah, yeah. No, I've I've seen some of them on YouTube. They uh, yeah, looking at them now, it's a bit funny at times. It yes. it is a bit funny, but you know, it it's an interesting insight because it it's really the program is no different from programs you would have seen on British TV. Uh, aside uh, from the political uh, aside, uh, no, so apart apart from the political thing. Yeah. Yes. So so you know, like when when I I just I looked at one of those books more recently again. Oh, it was quite funny. It was obviously like a com conversation with somebody in London, and and of course, you know, he would only read the Morning Star, and, and of course, that's, and that's that's the most important newspaper that really tells people what's going on in the UK. Yeah, and and you know, it was all biased. Yeah, at, at some funny little level that you wouldn't necessarily realize at the time. Yeah, you well, you wouldn't have re realized in yeah from no. from your point of view at that time. Wouldn't have known then. No, no. no. Obviously, no. looking at it now, I yeah. think like that's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, and the Morning Star still keeps going somewhere. Well, yeah, yeah. I used to, I used to so. read that at times here, not anymore. But. No. Um, okay, so um, so you're aiming to get to university. That that's so, your, your uh, yeah. You're so. quite focused on that, were you? As a kind of yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's basically. I mean, obviously, in in in, in Germany, or certainly in East Germany, you have continuous um, examination at school mm -hmm. so at the at the end of each year you get to like a, like an end of year um, certificate basically which which gives you marks for each subject right. etc and you had to pass yeah so if you if you had a five which was like a fail basically yeah. if you had a five in any subject you 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 had to reset it if you had a five in two subjects a fail in two subjects you were you were put back a year mm -hmm. in school so mm -hmm. Unlike the UK, you know, you, yeah. don't, you don't really get this continuous examination yeah. here, but, but in East Germany, you did. So, so from early on, basically, they, they could see, you know, who, who is good academically, yeah. you know, who, who might have the stuff to do, go right. on, to go into university to yeah. study, et cetera. So, and then, then I don't know, I don't want to blow my own time, but I think I was pretty good. So, well, I've, so I've it, was, it was sort of fairly clear yeah. from the start that I would be going on to do something else. Yeah, because you, you know, you read and, and I spoke to other people from the GDR and they were, they were saying that, um, sometimes it was also based around who the parents were as well, whether um, you go and. Yeah, yes and no. Yeah. The, 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 not at school, but, but, but obviously when it then came to, to, to go to university, for example, you mm -hmm. know, there were obviously there were certain places, certain types of certain university, like, like Humboldt University and 
Berlin it was, it would have been the top university. So that's like the Cambridge or Oxford of totally, the UK. Yes, yeah. yes. So, so you know, like you had the Humboldt Universität in, in Berlin, which would be like Cambridge, Oxford type type place. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was also the Karl Marx Universität in, in Leipzig, which, yeah. which was the other big one. Yeah. You know, it's sort of posh in, yeah. in a way, not posh, but in, um, elitist ones. Right. So, and obviously, if you if you wanted to study at certain courses there, it had to have connections. Right. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but only for a small number of people. Yeah. yeah. You know, the vast majority of courses or vast majority of, of, of avenues you might go into had nothing to do yeah. with connections. Yeah. I, I've asked various people this and they, I get various responses, mostly can't remember, but, um, mm. or don't the want, studying don't want of, to remember. Well, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> probably I exactly. But obviously you, you had to study Marxism, Leninism as, as mm -hmm. part of one, one of your, your core subjects. Did you find yes. that really dull and really... Very dull. Right. Really <laughs> heavy going, I presume. Oh, very dull. Yes. Yeah. Oh, look, I'm an engineer, so I'm, I'm, I'm not one for yeah. waffle yeah. too much. And, yeah. and, and studying Marxism, Leninism, studying, you know, the Wissenschaftlicher Kommunismus was, was another sub subject yeah you know, the scientific communism yeah and oh god yes it was very dull yeah yes it's it's having to read having to read marx is, is a pain yes so i know because i had to read plenty of him yeah there's um, not a lot of jokes in there not many no <laughs> not ordinarily anyway no. no but i mean to be fair though you know reading reading lenin is, is a little bit different so it's more like reading a history book yeah, and, and, and reading Lenin is actually kind of quite interesting in a way. Right, you know, leaving leaving the the, the ideological side apart, yeah. but it's it's more like reading a history book. Yeah, whereas Marx is just is just dull. Yeah, dry, boring. Yeah. Oh God, no. <laughs> and then obviously, you know, and those those sort of subjects, you know, in terms of being examined then and and be, being able to show that that you've understood what was talked about is is basically just a matter of of memorizing phrases and. And regurgitating uh, regurgitating what's what's written in in Marx and yeah. in books you know yeah. and, and regurgitating their definitions of of certain things right which I find extremely dull so no I, I, I can imagine well I can't even imagine studying Marxism uh, no. Leninism but you've I mean you've there, given there, me there a are people that love it but yeah but not me no although I always got top marks in it but anyway but but I didn't like it yeah. Well, you were good at memorizing and regurgitating. Uh, I guess I must have been at that time. Yeah, I couldn't do yeah. it now. Yeah, no, absolutely. Wouldn't want to. No. <laughs> um, so how how did you end up in the NVA, the East German Army, from, yeah. from well, that at, education? Well, basically at age 16, you had to make that decision. Um, well, you had to make that decision to apply. Didn't mean you were you were locked into it then, but but you know application for for longer service in in, in the NFR mm. would have been at age sixteen if you wanted to be a professional soldier. Um, basically, I just didn't know any better, and I thought it sounded like a cool thing to do. Yeah, and and that's all it was. I did. I, there was nobody in my family that 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 served right longer yeah. in in the army. So there's nobody in my family. There's no, no uncles or cousins or anybody like that. Or certainly not my father that, that I could have drawn back on to get some experience. I, I knew nothing about the army at that time, really. Um, and, and just basically, yeah, I mean, that's, 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 that's how I usually say it. I didn't know any better. Right. So I sort of applied for it and I applied to, to, to become an officer, professional officer in the army, which meant 25 years minimum service. So when you signed up, you signed up for twenty five years. Wow. And that was it. And there was no get once you're sworn in, then there was no getting out of it. Yeah. Unless unless on, on medical grounds or well, for example, declaring that you were gay was a way of getting out of it. But you know, obviously there were yeah. there was lots of probing then and, and checking and interviewing to make sure that you weren't just saying that. Mm -hmm. Um happened to one guy while I was in the army. Mm -hmm. Well what happened to but one guy did declare that he was gay yeah. and had to run through through quite a rigorous process of of interviews and checks etc and eventually was let go without repercussions but but so it was age 16 um, um i decided to to apply for it um schools had to fulfill sort, certain quotas in in recruiting or not recruiting but in in promoting people to to serve longer in the army to become professional soldiers so obviously my school with me applying to be a, a, a roofs officer so a professional officer 
was very pleased with that and, and I certainly got got um let's just say well yeah preferential treatment in a way I was certainly a favored boy at school yeah it was good for the school too it was good for the school it helped them fulfill their their quotas yeah you know in, in terms of uh, promoting people yeah. to to join the army uh, as professional soldiers because you would have been conscripted anyway wouldn't you if, would have been conscripted there was 18 months conscription in east germany yes so one and a half years so every everyone every able bodied male yeah. had to do 18 months and what age was the conscription 18 18 okay yes so so that would have been well normally at 18 yeah. 18 19 mm-hmm. so depending on what you were doing if you did this this was called BMA, this Borussia's Bildung mit Abitur, you know, this, this, um, doing an apprenticeship with, with A levels, that was three years. So obviously you would have only finished that at, at age 19. And then immediately after that, you, you, you went to do your, your service, your national service in the army. So, so everyone did it after their formal schooling mm-hmm. was, was completed or, or apprenticeship was completed. And before do, before going to university, if you decided to go to university. Right. So, um, like I said, at age 16, then I, I, um, age 15, 16, you know, I'd sort of put my name down and applied to be a professional soldier. Um, you know, you were basically kind of immediately accepted. You know, you didn't have to go through, through any sort of formal selection process at that stage. Um, the army then, 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 well, you know, because academically I was, was bringing the right results. I think, I think in terms of, um, uh, politically, I was, doing the right things you were getting top marks in marxism leninism uh, well, so that yeah, probably would have helped uh, yeah also i was the head boy at school actually i was the fdr secretary at my school oh okay so which we haven't mentioned yet no um but but so so like politically everything was correct and fine and done mm. with me ticked all the boxes basically yeah. so 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 you know when i applied at, at, at 15 16 the the army actually sort of thought i should become a pilot and they sent me to to the, the Air Force officer school for, for aptitude training, which I didn't really want to, but, but I thought right. let's go along and have a look anyway and yeah. spend three days there with, with all sorts of funny tests yeah. being done. And what, what did that what were those tests that they were I mean mostly they were basically the it was at the at the uh, OISD, the Officer Social School in, in Carmen's for the for the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And, and then we spent like I said it was three days we spent there. So there were a lot of medical tests. So mm. um, medical checks, medical tests. To, to check your so eyesight and a lot like more that. than just eyesight yeah but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there was there was a lot of medical tests um, and then then the rest of the time was basically just spent you know like them basically selling themselves to us you know that that you know giving us a good time yeah you know sit sit in a mic and and the mic was you know mic twenty one and the mic twenty one was 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 fired through and. Yeah. And, you know, and, and sit in a helicopter and, and, yeah. you know. Yeah. This is much better than a tank. You don't want to go. Well, it's basically, yes, along those lines. So, yeah. you know, they were selling themselves to us as well. That, that, and, and, but, but I didn't really want to do it. So, but, and, and, and they, they did offer me actually to become a pilot then, but I turned it down. So you had a choice. Right. Didn't, didn't have to do as you were yeah. Um, and then when it came to actually picking, I can't remember what, what I think that was at age 16. Where you actually had to pick then your specialization that you, you know, one thing is applying to be a professional soldier. And then a little bit later on, you then had to pick what specialization you wanted. Right. You know, where, where, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? Yeah. Do you want to do tanks? Do you want to, do you want to be a pilot? Do you want, yeah. do you want whatever? Yeah. And, and you got two choices basically. And, and again, I didn't have a clue. I had no idea. Yeah. What I wanted. Yeah. But you knew you didn't want to be a pilot. I knew I didn't want to be a pilot because basically I can't handle heights. So obviously right. that, that doesn't help. And they didn't pick that up in the they aptitude didn't, test. No, they didn't pick that up. I think <laughs> I told them, but, but they just ignored it. Yeah. I don't know. They probably thought we were going to beat that into him. If, yeah. In one way get or another. over that. <laughs> you get over that. Yeah. But, you know, but anyway, so I'm, I'm not good with heights. So obviously I didn't know we could I be a pilot. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, forget that doesn't matter. Um, that's, that's, um, so yeah. So, so I just had a look, you know, we had a brochure. I remember it was actually it was in 1984. So how old, how old was I then? Yeah, 16. Yeah. Um, so we had a brochure basically, and within that that brochure, you had all the, the the possible profiles that you could do as a professional soldier within either the Grenztruppen or or the the army right. or or the navy or or the air force. At that point, it was still open. So at that point, I'd only signed up to be a professional officer. Not not yeah. not doesn't matter if it's Grenztruppen or army or or, or police or whatever it might be mm-hmm. um 
And then I had to look at the profiles and I just picked the ones that I thought sounded cool. <laughs> and that was it. So, so my first choice was, was to be artillery officer. Um, or proper name, I think was commander of artillery units. Mm -hmm. And within that, then you could still pick a specialization and, and I picked self propelled artillery because I thought it sounded cool. Means you don't have to walk. <laughs> means you don't have to walk too much. No, uh, means you don't have to walk too much. It's kind of still tanks, but, but not as cramped as a tank. Yeah. So, and obviously I'm quite tall, so tank, tank would have been a problem for me anyway. Yeah, those T-72s uh, look quite uh, cramped to me, they're, very low silhouette. They're quite low and, and there's not a lot of space in them. Yeah. So then you had a bit more space in a, in a self-propelled, you know, artillery tank. Yeah. Effectively. Um, and, and so that was my first choice and, and second choice because, again, I probably I'm, I'm, I don't have enough imagination, but I just picked the second choice was to be a political officer for, mm -hmm artillery units right so so you know obviously there were political officers yeah. in the army commissar if you want to call him that, yeah yeah but obviously we didn't call him that but mm. um the equivalent to that um and 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 most specializations also had political officers with that specialization so so like infantry would have had political officers with with infantry specialization yeah. artillery signalers you know all all, all of them Tanks. Yeah. You know, there would have been political officers with tank specialization. So, so I did, I made that my second choice. And I d I'm just interested to know why you would have made that as a, as a choice if you're finding. Because I thought artillery was cool and those were the two artillery options. Oh, right. Those were the only two that, that were there. So yep. you thought that's if all, I go for all two, if I go for two artillery options, I've got a better chance of getting. I, I, I get at least one of the artillery options. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah. I just, and I, I, I don't know why I had no particular interest in artillery or anything like that. I just thought it sounded cool. Yeah. Well, I guess in a way, is there a? I'm trying to think whether there's an engineering angle there, but I guess there isn't. No. But it is mechanical. But well, it is engineering, yes, and so. physics and oh, it's very much all math. Artillery is all all mathematics and physics. Yeah, so that's that's what artillery is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And what what was the officer training like? I mean, what what did that entail? Twenty four seven. Um, so I then went at age 18 then, you know, after, mm. after having done the Abitur and after having completed schooling, obviously I then, then joined the army, which I think was on the, either the 25th or 26th of August, 1987. Um, very long time ago. Um, and, and I was the, 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 the artillery training or the artillery school for the army was, was in a place called Sitau. And Sitau is just in the, in the, the, the sort of, Three, three. It's a, tri a triangle between between Poland, Czechoslovakia, and East Germany. If you imagine that, okay. and right in that triangle is where the school was. Right. So okay. it's literally, you know, looking out the window to the left, to, or two hundred meters to the left was Poland, three hundred meters to the right was Czechoslovakia. Right. Um, obviously, there was a reason strategically why why there was an army installation exactly in that place. Yeah. Um, but um, then, then you know, went to the went to the army and and went to the officers school let's call it that um maybe before talking about that is what's 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 maybe important to know as well is is in, in east germany if you wanted to be an officer it doesn't matter if it was grenztruppen or, or army or air force or police or, or firefighters it doesn't matter what if you if you wanted to be an officer you needed to have a university degree so um so every every officer's school every officer college was also a university level academic institution mm -hmm. um so certainly from from 1983 on the, the studying to be an officer took four years and that four years meant that that you know 24 7 basically you lived the army life and and you had to do everything that that entails and 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 that was fairly tough it wasn't wasn't easy um, but at the same time you're also studying for a university degree and artillery to come back to that meant that i was studying for mechanical engineering degree Okay. So, so on graduating from the officer school, I would have, which obviously never happened because the war came down at some point. Yeah. Um, and then cut all that short, but, 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 but I would have graduated then as, as a lieutenant, as a lieutenant, but also as a BNG honors in mechanical engineering. Right. Okay. After four years. Yeah. Um, so, so army, so, so life at, at the officer school basically meant, like I said, 24 seven army life, but also do academic studies. At, yeah. at the at the office of school, yeah. So oh, okay. fully equipped to do to do the civilian degree at the same time as doing all the right. all the military stuff. 
Right. And you didn't have to be a member of the SED to be an officer? You didn't have to be. No. no. Okay. But you were certainly encouraged. Right. Uh, okay. You were certainly encouraged. And I think I think in the end, I think the number was, was 98%, I think, of all, of all officers yeah. in the army were right. members of the SED. Yeah. Um, I was in my unit, in my platoon. I, I, I joined up. I joined, I joined the SED. So yeah. I was a member of the SED. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I only, only signed up for it halfway through, basically halfway through my yeah. service yeah. time. And, and me and, and, and another guy, you know, my, one of my mates, mm. basically, we were the last two in my platoon. Right. The last two, two, two to succumb to the pressure. The last two to apply. Yes. Yeah. So everyone else was already yeah. either a member or a candidate. You know, yeah. like to yeah. become a member of the SED, you had to be a candidate for twelve months first to prove yourself that you're worthy, right, of joining the 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 illustrious ranks of, of yeah. SED membership. Yeah. Um. So so and and so I became a full member of the SED in the summer of of 1989. Oh, perfect timing. Oh, right at the end. Yeah, I didn't I didn't have to endure too many party meetings. Oh. Uh, that's a Luckily. blessing. There's a blessing. There. Well, there were still plenty of them, but not not too many. Yeah, yeah. could have been worse. Um, so, it, as part of your training, were you told much about NATO and what the expecting tactics were supposed to be from NATO? Or yes, you were. Oh yes, yes. I mean, obviously, that that that's it's, it's something called fine build. So you know, you had to know your enemy. Yeah, and obviously, you had to know your enemy to be able to fight them. It should have mm. come to that. Um, and and yes, of course, yes. You know, we had we had obviously tactics classes. We had we had specific classes about NATO tactics, about NATO weapons, weapon systems, right? That that we may end up facing in the field. So obviously, if you if you if you um, if you're opposite another unit from from another army, you kind of need to know what the capabilities of that unit are to be able to to react and to be able to defend yourself, yeah, or attack, yeah, as it may be, yeah. Um, but Yes, so there was, there was, there was certainly yes, there was training on that. And did that uh, appear to be quite comprehensive information, or mm, was it? The, the, there was comprehensive information available. The 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 the, the teaching of specifically NATO um, things mm. was was it wasn't that much. Yeah, to be honest, I mean, comprehensive information was available. Yes, yeah, and then you can see that now in the 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 Faustdienstvorschriften, mm. you know, that 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 obviously are available now that you can get. There's, there's, there's pretty much all, all NATO weapon systems will have been catalogued and, yeah. and, and will have been known. All NATO units will have been known, you know, their, their, their locations will have been known. Yeah. And, and that was taught at the officer school. Yeah. But not, not to a huge extent. So it didn't take up a lot of time, mm. those lessons, but it was taught. Um, also maybe one thing to, 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 mentioned when it comes to that is we were we were constantly being told that that we are we are a defensive army you know because obviously there are all these rumors going around about east germany having planned to invade west germany and you know fighting their way through to bordeaux and, and mm. which i'm sure those plans existed i know they existed but but those were just plans you know the, the actual training and and that and, and indoctrination if you want to call it that is we were constantly being being trained to be a defensive army to defend ourselves against an attack. Right. Not to lead an attack. Yeah. Counterattacks, yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. And the, the counterattack was probably in the same, but at yeah. the end of the day. But 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 the official language yes. was that, 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 that we were that we were a, a defensive force. Right. Not an attack yeah. force. No, I was going to ask you that because obviously yeah, there is that that quandary about, you know, that it's always portrayed within East Germany as a defensive force, yet yeah. In the yeah. West, it was, you know, the attacks. The opposite the, was. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously, we were told we were told exactly the same about about the West. Yes. That of course, you know, we could. Why, why would we want to attack anyone? You know, yeah. we're, we're peace loving. Yeah. People, you know, if there was to be a war, it, it will originate yeah. from the West. It will not originate from us. And at the time, how much did you believe that? Well, for one, I mean, there was no reason not to believe it. In a way. Mm-hmm. Um. I would have, I would say yes, would have believed that. Yeah. Yes. We, we had no, um, certainly from, from the rhetoric, from, from the training that I received at the officer school or officer college, from, from newspapers and everything else, there was, there was no desire to have a war or to, to start a war or to, to, to attack anyone. Mm-hmm. 
So yeah. that that was certainly the official line. Yeah. Yeah. No. The East Don Block. That that we we would we 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 know how to defend ourselves, but we would not start a war. Yeah. No. Un- understood. <clears throat> at, at, at the time, I mean, you you mentioned being based at Zital. So did you yeah. not have? Were you? I guess it was really frowned on for you to watch Western TV or anything. You were certainly not meant to, right. um, but there was no official um, uh, edict that said you could not or that you were not punished for watching West German TV or listening to West German radio. Um, that's not true. So, so you know, if anyone says, oh, you know, Stasi would knock on your door and yeah. take you away at the middle of the night, that's that's rubbish. That, yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah, they'd run out of prison space. <laughs> well, they'd run out of a lot of, yeah, very quickly. Yeah. So, um, but... Um, there's obviously geographic limitations on, on where you can receive West Yeah, because you're TV. near Dresden, the Valley of the Clueless. Yes, uh, yeah, the Tarder Ahnungslosen. Yeah. Yes, the Valley of the Clueless. Um, so, so in obviously, well, in Sittau, for example, you could, just could not receive it. Right. It wasn't possible. Um, so certainly in that area, people would not have been able to watch uh, West German TV, listen to West German radio. The, 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 for them, it didn't exist. Um, but where I'm from was only... 30, 40 kilometers away from the West German border. So, so obviously I grew up watching West German TV right. and, 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 and listening to the radio. Yeah. Throughout, you know, until I was 18. Mm. Until I had to move to the Tada Ahnungslosen and then all that stopped. Yeah. So, so, and then, yeah, so I, so I, yes, I, 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 I watched that all my life and, and, and we watched it at home. We had it at home. Mm. I mean, it was a thing that like, you know, well, if you were a party member, you were sort of the party kind of would have told you not to have West German programs on. Yeah. And you were so, so supposed to stick to that. Or let's say if you work for the Stasi, for example, you would have been expected not to. And you may have had repercussions through in, within the party mm-hmm. or, or within the, like the Stasi, if that was your workplace. If, if you had been caught or found out to be watching West German TV or listening to West German yeah. radio. But, but for ordinary people, it yeah. didn't, that there was no. I, I mean, and again, this is sort of, you know, you hear different views from different people, but certainly, you know, if, if you were talking about West German TV programs at school that you'd mm. watched, would the teachers pick up on that and would there be... I think they did, yes. But yeah. whether, whether whether they then sort of passed that on to anybody else yeah. was, was, I think, obviously down to their discretion. Yeah. So whether they did or not, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's actually there's one particular episode or little thing that sort of sticks in my mind. Where, where, you know, like primary school level, you know, I don't know why I remember. I just remember I can, I can see it now happening in, in, in class, in school, where basically the teacher just asks, Oh, you know, who is, who is the, who knows who the prime minister of West Germany is? Who knows who the foreign secretary or the foreign minister is of West Germany? Who at the time, and I was like, me, me, me. And, you know, and then, you know, so certain people obviously put their hands up and, and, and said the names and stuff. Thinking about it now, obviously that was, they, they would have been taking notes. And those, 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 the answers and who gave those answers to those questions will have gone to somewhere else. Right. And I know that now. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a reason why I don't want to see my Stasi files. No, no. But, but now I know that. Yes. But yeah. obviously at the time, wouldn't have realized that. But yes, so there, there was things like that. There, there were things like that going on. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, sorry, going back, going back to your service in the in the NVA. Sure. Can yeah. you describe any of the exercises that you were involved in? Well, actually, like like joint army exercises. Yeah. Oh, I didn't none, none. No, I was wasn't involved in any. There weren't any major army exercises during right. my time. So I was I was in it from eighty seven to nineteen ninety. Okay. There weren't any any major army exercises during that time, or more so packed yeah. army joint joint army exercises. Um, to be fair, you know, even if there had been. I wouldn't as, as an officer student wouldn't have been involved in that. Right. Very unlikely. Yeah. There would have been regular army units, you know, people actually serving out in the field yeah. basically that, yeah. that that were involved in that. So, yeah. so, so because didn't take you part didn't in anything because like you that. didn't graduate effectively exactly. out of officer school. You yes. you never really ended up in the full army and, and the I never never ended up those. like you know, serving in the field yeah. as such as an officer. Yeah. So I never never became an officer. So, you know, when the war came down I was in the middle of third year. Yeah. At, 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 at the officer college. So obviously that, that cut all that short and then very quickly it was all over. And, yeah. And so I never, I never got to graduate. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I understand that you did participate in the 40th anniversary, um, parade. Right. Oh, yes. Can you take me through that day? Just that day? 
Well, as you can imagine, that's not the end of Torsten's story. We have a further episode coming soon where he talks about the 40th anniversary parade and the time he met Yasser Arafat. Don't miss it. Also, don't forget to check out the show notes for this episode, which include some photos of Torsten in the National Volksarmee, some video and some links to his website. The show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 39. If you like what you're listening to, do join our Facebook discussion group where there's loads of Cold War information and further discussions with our listeners and guests. Just search for Cold War Conversations on Facebook. And if you are a Twitter fan, we're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod. Lastly, if you like what you're hearing, and I hope you do, do leave reviews with your podcast provider or share us via social media. It really helps to increase awareness of the podcast and helps us get some great new guests. Thank you so much for listening and supporting us. It is really appreciated. Goodbye.